All right, we're going to uh, jump into our preaching time. Let's turn to John chapter number 20, our lectionary passage for this season. Of course, it is not lost upon us that Easter, Resurrection Sunday, of course, last week, the culmination of our season of Lent, and now we are in a time of resurrection. And I want you to always remember that resurrection does not stop happening for the child of God, that we are constantly experiencing resurrections with a small r. Somebody say amen, right? And so John chapter 20, verse 19 is where we'll spend our time. Amen. You may have to kill some of these lights up here because it's a little too, it's washing out our, our screen. Amen. Maybe the floor lights, is that better? A little bit? Maybe so. Touch your neighbor with consent, all right? John chapter 20, verse number 19. I love the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is uh, one of uh, these most um, important but different accounts of the life and teachings of Jesus. John is probably one of the last Gospels written, at least by one of the eyewitnesses of Jesus. Uh, and he wrote this Gospel in response to uh, some false teachings that were springing up that were trying to say that Jesus was not actually human. He was a lifelong spirit or ghost that people thought were human. And there was this teaching that was starting to proliferate that John felt the need to disprove and discount because the teaching was arguing against the valuable nature or value of the physical body. It's called Gnosticism. And it was this idea, or docetism, it was this idea that our bodies are not uh, good. And because they're not good, then Jesus could not have been both human and divine at the same time. He just was only a spirit, only a ghost. Man, kind of like I see dead people type action, right? And, and so John was writing his gospel to not only disprove this, but to also affirm that Jesus was both God and man at the same time. Jesus had both the power of eternity and the power of, of this, this current reality, both in his own body, in his own life, at work. And uh, while you and I may never reach the potency of that truth, how many of you know that there's more to you than meets the eye? Somebody say amen, right? And so we're gonna spend a little bit of time uh, wrestling with what does it mean for us to live in light of resurrection and what are the ways that Jesus invites us to begin again, to begin again in light of all of the challenges that we may, that we will, or that we are facing. John 19 verse number, uh, John 20 verse 19, the scripture says, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house were where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After Jesus said this, Jesus showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Amen. I can do a lot with that. Maybe I will a little later. Amen. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, Jesus' disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. 
Jesus said to Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Oh, the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So let's speak from the topic today. We can begin again. We can begin again. Bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts, O oh God, so we will not sin against you. And let the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy may it rest upon me and your hearers. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them we can begin again. Amen. We can begin again. Now, one of the greatest struggles for the follower of Jesus, the child of God, you and I, who are attempting to navigate a world and a life that is characterized by death, by disappointment, by all kinds of tragedies, and sometimes even unexpected uh, occurrences, you and I will have to contend with these moments of post-resurrection realities. Meaning, how can I live in light of resurrection when I am still surrounded by all of these forces that work to harm me the first time? Mm -hmm. How am I to reconcile what I have come to see and experience and believe even though I have held these truths close to me and I come out of resurrection on the other side believing in the impossibility, right? Because hopefully what resurrection does for you is it stretches your imagination. Hello, somebody. Amen. If nothing else, resurrection should stretch your imagination. It should help you to expand what you think is possible. Man, because, you know, when you die, how many know, for the most part, that's supposed to be it? At least that's what, you know, was the normal occurrence before Jesus got up, right? The disciples felt like, you know, man, this is, this is interesting. Before I met Jesus, you know, when, when folks died, they stayed dead. Yeah. But then when I met, met Jesus, you know, I literally see dead people walking around. Yeah. I mean, Jared's daughter, you know, or, or, or Lazarus or, or these different folk who were dead. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up and they walking around again. I hope that helps you to appreciate that when Jesus walks into your life, what you thought was over. Mm, it changes things. Give me a high five and tell him Jesus changes things. It changes things, right? And knowing that it changes things, how do you reconcile with the reality that, man, some of this stuff still persists? I was reminded of the words of Franz Fanon in Black Skin's White Mass, where he says, sometimes people hold a core belief that is very strong. And when they are presented with evidence that works against that belief, the new evidence cannot be accepted it will create a feeling that is extremely uncomfortable called cognitive dissonance. And because it is so important to protect the core belief, they will rationalize, ignore, and even deny anything that doesn't fit in with the core belief. It's a little France Fanon for your light reading today. Somebody say amen, right? How, how many of you know that this kind of dissonance can cut both ways? And I've met a lot of folk. Sometimes it has been cut in both ways in my life. It can describe the crisis of faith that many of us endure on the heels of the constant flow of personal, communal, national, and global tragedies that we are constantly bombarded with. Amen. The cognitive dissonance. I, th I thought God was a good God, but why is there so much evil? 
I thought the house of worship, the house of God was supposed to be a place of refuge and safety. How is it that deranged gunmen can come into God's house and kill people who are there worshiping God? Cognitive dissonance. Some experience such dissonance in matters of faith because of the presence of evil. Some experience cognitive or theological dissonance because of the presentation of a fundamentalist, legalistic faith that is too rigid to account for the complexity of human lives and experiences. Or some, like some of these disciples, you have a cognitive dissonant because you realize, man, what I see happening don't measure with what I thought or held to be true. Some folks going through the Western academic inquiry process have a dissonance that is related to the problematizing of the supernatural. Man, you know, folks that feel like the supernatural, those things you can't explain, the uh, faith and, 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 and the transcendence of, of, of things beyond your, your knowledge base are things to be discarded rather than things to be engaged over a lifetime of practice and experience. I want to lift up that dissonance is itself uncomfortable but necessary for the child of God who would be faithful to live out the ways of Jesus in a world characterized by the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit that is antithetical to the life and the teachings of Jesus. It's important for you and I to wrestle with this dissonance rather than ignore it or run away from it. For it is in these kinds of struggles that I believe resurrection, new beginnings, new opportunities emerge without your permission. I want you to know that when you wrestle and when you struggle, you will end up with a divine surprise. You will end up with a result that you could not manufacture on your own. Why? Because resurrection is not something you and I can manufacture. It is nothing but a result of the magnificent demonstration of the power of the living God. And I want you to know, child of God, if you are in a place where you're experiencing dissonance, then you are in a place of a setup. Where God will, as the scripture says, give you enough proof so you will come to believe that Christ was the Messiah and the son of the living God. It is these kinds of struggles that I think often characterize how we are to live in light of resurrection. Because guess what? After Jesus was resurrected, the first response of the disciples was to do what? Go and lock themselves up in a room. <laughs> man, amen, amen. And you know, you keep it real, some of us, we locking ourselves up in a room. Matter of fact, we lock ourselves up in rooms right now. We don't even have to wait for no divine manifestation. Somebody say amen. Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, she says that the resurrection is God's definitive triumph over crucifying evil power. That the power of evil that seeks to crucify the creation of God is real. This is not a figment of our imagination. The mass shooting is not a figment of our imagination. The, the, the challenge in your relationships, your, your marriage, your children, is not a figment of your imagination. The empire, the death dealing, the injustice on your job and in the street is not a figment of your imagination. But resurrection is God's definitive reminder that those things cannot stop God's power. To help you bounce back. Oh, my goodness. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I got bounce back power. That, that's why you, you run up against the obstacle. Resurrection reminds you that you can bounce back. The resurrection shows, according to Kelly Brown Douglas, that the power that denigrates human bodies and destroys life is revealed as actually illusory and certainly no match for God. Ooh. Lord, 
Lord, have mercy. Amen. Yo, your problem is no match for God. The resurrection shows that evil has no stable existence. The resurrection shows that in the end, the one that was crucified was restored to life. The resurrection shows that in the end, crucifixion and resurrection witness, listen to a force that restores justice to the universe. It is a force that repudiates and virtually makes a joke of the crucifying powers in the world. Man, the resurrection helps you to square your shoulders back and tell the devil the joke's on you, devil. Man, you thought you had me, but the joke is on you. And I want you to go throughout your week telling that to your situation, telling that to the obstacles in your life and in your family. You thought you killed me, but the joke's on you. Oh, Lord, I don't know what's going on. I feel a little preach going on. And when you live your life with that confidence as a resurrected person, when you live your life in light of resurrection as a truth, listen, you will have the capacity to hate oppression without hating your oppressor. You will have the ability to abhor violence without dehumanizing the agent of violence. And this is what resurrection does. It helps you to uncouple the kind of death dealing that is seductive even to we who are being killed. Because for many of us, say, man, you know, my response is I believe in nonviolence. Just don't push me. Somebody say amen, right? Amen. Amen. There's a, a lot of conditions on this here thing. But resurrection helps you to be able to say, even if you slay me, yet will I trust God. You can take my house. You can take my car. You can even take my life. You can take my reputation. You can take my money. You can take my honey. You can take all these things that I think I can't live without. But because resurrection is true. I don't got to hate you because you an agent of my oppression amen now i need to stay away from you somebody say amen but i don't have to become you and that's a real truth you and i have to wrestle with because all of us would love to believe we're never the agent of someone else's oppression amen man we all like to believe our hands are never clean are never dirty but you better be more humble child of god Amen. You, you, don't, you don't know what you do in the folk until they tell you you doing it. Anybody ever met somebody, amen, who, 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 who you had to tell them you are harming me? And then they get so surprised. Oh, me? <laughs> You're like, yes, man. You hurt me. Yeah, man, I remember, I remember a few times folks had said that to me. And, I, you know, I was shocked. Said, I, I didn't mean no harm. I was an agent of someone's oppression. I didn't wake up trying to oppress them today. So I thank God they told me the truth. Give you never high five and tell them, tell me the truth, please. Just tell it to me. Don't be lying to me. So how can you and I begin again? The, 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 the couple things I, I, I want to lift up, the first thing that I think is worthy of our consideration, we can begin again. Listen, Jesus shows up and he speaks to our irrational fears and our dissonant faith. Somebody say irrational fear, irrational fear. and dissonant faith. faith. It's worth noting how, how powerful fear is when you and I can't reconcile the threats that are imminent in our lives. You know, it's, it's, it's funny on some level that the disciples, you know, hung out with Jesus and Jesus told them everything that was getting ready to happen. He said, listen now, in a, in, in a few days, I'm about to die. Oh, Jesus, you're not going to die. You are a revolutionary leader. Man, we about to overthrow Rome. Jesus like, well, no, I'm, I'm about to die. No, Jesus, you ain't about to die. And Jesus had to say, say this, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I'm not telling you to say that to nobody this week. Amen. Unless you have to. Amen. <laughs> well, some of these folk in your life, they're trying to tell you the opposite of what you know your purpose is. You ought to 
just tell them, get behind me, Satan. Hey, man, I think I'm going to put that on a T-shirt. Hey, Amen. You wear, you know, get behind me, Satan, because you, 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 you mingling in things that don't have nothing to do with you right now. Jesus told him, I'm getting ready to die. I'm getting ready to go through all this. Like, no, Jesus, not you, not you. Jesus, not you. And he's just, no, I'm about to do it. It's about to go down. And then Jesus dies. And I know all of it was like, man, Jesus wasn't playing. But what's so deep about it? Jesus died. They were associated with Jesus. And so guess what? They were afraid that they would be next. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden, Jesus you know, wakes up or uh, raised from the dead on a Sunday morning. The women come, and they, they're the first to proclaim Jesus is alive, goes back, tells the brothers. Only two of the brothers came outside. Because mm-hmm. the rest of them were scared, like, I'm not going over there. Them sisters is delusional. Why would I be showing up to a place where they got police and soldiers? They looking for us. They got our pictures out wanted. The 11 disciples who still remain, because one of them killed themselves. And Jesus, Jesus is alive, and the women is proclaiming. Couples show up, and they go back. They are just in awe, the scripture says. So what do you think about this? All of them have been primed for Jesus' resurrection. And when it happened, they still could not fully understand what happened. And so they were still more afraid of the others the tormentors that killed Jesus rather than the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Now, it's worth pointing out, you know, particularly in light of this this, this shooting in the the synagogue and and the the previous shootings in the synagogues, that, that, you know, anti-Semitism is a real thing out here in these streets. Man, folk can read some of these passages of scripture where it says they were locked themselves in a house for fear of the Jews and folk for millennia have attempted to blame Jews for the death of Jesus. And people can read scripture and get all these crazy interpretations that fuel their already irrational fears. And so of course Jews are not responsible for the, the killing of Jesus. Man, you can't put collective punishment on the whole people like that. There were some crazy folk at that time, some unfaithful folk at that time, just like there's some crazy folk at this time and some unfaithful folk at this time. Man, I tell folk all the time, if you're going to blame the Jews, you got to blame all Americans for Donald Trump, amen, and Barack Obama and George Bush. Lord, don't please don't blame me for these folk actions. My question to the church is how can we be faithful in light of this unfaithful leadership we have and you know irrational fear they had an irrational fear of the Jews listen all of us have to check our irrational fears that lead us to lock ourselves up in rooms oh I don't have the time to speak on this like I need to but a lot of us got an irrational fear of, of the browning of America, irrational fear of the queering of the church, an irrational fear of the, of the, of the, the, the kind of, 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 of exploitation and warmongering and, and, and violence and all these different things. And when you have irrational fear, you will do irrational things. Your response to people will be irrational because you can't reconcile things you don't understand. That's where faith becomes critical. You have to believe in the power of God to make all things right. More than you believe in the presence of evil that is making all things wrong. You know, I know I'm speaking big, big terms, but just drill it on down into your family, into your job, into your, your, your school, into, into your own journey. You're going to have all kind of conflicting reports about who you are and what you can do and where you can go. But you're going to have to believe that the power of resurrection is greater than these voices I hear in my head that keep reminding me of my failure or my inadequacy or my insufficiency. I believe that God can bring me out of this situation because if he did it before, Jesus. Uh, Pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm not the first one to go through this. 
Man, too many of us, we, you, you, think, you, you think you're too much of a novelty. Yeah, man, you ain't the first one. You ain't the first one to be treated unfairly. You ain't the first one to be cheated on. You ain't the first one to be abused. You ain't the first one. And so if God brought them out, why can't God bring you out? If God healed their broken heart, why can't God heal your broken heart? If God let the loan come through and the grant come through and your fellowship come through, why can't God do it for everybody else? Oh, Lord, help me. Irrational fear. Jesus speaks to their irrational fear. How does he speak to it? Jesus says, peace be with you. The, 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 re the remedy to your irrational fear is the peace of God. Ooh, that passes all understanding. And not only does Jesus speak to you, he acts with love. So Jesus speaks and he acts. That's a good kind of prescription for you. How do I speak peace into my situation? How do I act with love? I was doing a little bit of studying on, on the way fear is released into the physical body of, of, of human beings and how when you have fear that gets triggered, you have cortisol and all these different hormones that, that release into your body because I think it's called the amygdala or something like that. I don't know. And, 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 and it gets all in your body and it makes you do a few things. Oh, let, let, let me not mess this up because I'm going to have to help somebody. It, 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 it helps you. It, your, the responses are either you fluff, you freeze, you fly, you flee, or you focus. Everybody say fluff, freeze, flee, or focus. Now, this was real deep, the fluff part. Because I was like, what time about fluff? I don't fluff. <laughs> Amen. But, but, they, but they, they, they said, you know, that when you get goosebumps and your hair kind of kind of stands up on your, 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 your skin, that back in another ancient time when homo sapiens were extremely hairy, this was deep. So what happened when you read, amen, you learn things. Said that, that the hair in, would stand up and so when you were met with something that, like a, 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 a wild animal or a beast, and, and, and the fear would trigger the hair, and it would make you look bigger. It would fluff you. It would make you look bigger to the predator so the predator would think twice about messing with you. Man, that thing blessed me a little bit. I was like, hmm. Sometimes, sometimes fear will make you try to act bigger than you really are. Man, that, that's that, you know, I, I talk to some of the brothers sometimes, and you know, you know, you, we got all these tempers and all these things, and somebody trigger us, and and and, and rather than us acknowledging that we are hurt. You know, we, 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 what, what, you know, you, you run up to somebody on the street and, you know, you, you, you start bucking up like, all right, I got to, I, I got to be bigger than I am. What, 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 you know? Uh, tell your neighbor, stop fluffing, amen. You ain't bigger than how you are. You ain't nothing but a human being. You freeze. Amen. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spoil spoil the Avengers, amen, that me and my daughters watched on opening night, amen. But I'll talk about the previous one, because if you ain't seen it by now, then I just don't know what to tell you. Amen. amen. But it was so interesting when 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 they was they was in there in, in, in the ship, the Guardians of the Galaxy and 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 uh the Gamora and the and the other guy, I can't remember the guy's name, the her love interest, they was, you know, uh hugging up and kissing and 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 the, the other guy, I can't even remember his name either, but the tall guy, the former wrestler. I don't remember his name, but he was just standing there and, and he, he was saying that he was standing there for an hour because he has mastered the art of being still so he can become invisible. 
Amen. So, you know, he, he, it was funny because he, of course, he wasn't invisible, but in his mind, he thought he was. <laughs> they said stress will freeze you because sometimes when you are under attack, you get still to hopefully not get, <laughs> to not attract. <laughs> hey, man, folk preaching their own message up in here. Hey, Amen. <laughs> To not attract unnecessary attention. How many have been frozen by fear? He's like, I, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna chill out right here because I don't want to attract unnecessary attention. Or you flee, amen. You get scared, you just start running. Or you focus. Fear helps your mind to focus on the imminent threat. Fluff, freeze. Flee, focus. This is just your natural response. But the physiological impact of fear, when it is perpetual, those natural responses actually degrade your quality of life. The disciples had a natural healthy dose of fear because these folk just killed their leader. But that fear caused them to lock themselves in their homes when they were already commissioned to go be witnesses. So I just want to ask you, where are you locking yourself up? Because of fear. You're locking yourself away from opportunity, away from healing, away from relationships, because you don't believe resurrection is more powerful than the threats of death or disappointment. Oh, that's the first question then. I, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm going along on this point, but, but, but the first question that I, I want you to think about, are there irrational fears which create irrational anger and pain for whoever that other is in your life? In this text, it was the Jews. You may have other folk that create irrational fears for you. Irrational means that you've given that more power than resurrection in your life. I'm not telling you to ignore fear because fear has a function. But when the fear paralyzes you, your fears become irrational. Because those fears can never overwhelm the promise of beginning again resurrection of a second chance and what must you do what steps must you take so you don't allow fear to serve as your open air prison if the fear keeps you from being free then you in an open air prison your imagination should be free yo 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 your aspiration your 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 ability to act free. That's what irrational fears and distant faith will do. Oh, last thing I, 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 I'll mention this morning. Jesus invites us to begin again through the wounds and the scars both he displays and that we have. You know, I, 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 I preached on this years ago. I can't remember what, what sermon it was. But, you know, uh, I have a, a, a cut on my stomach from getting my appendix out. And I used to play, you know, when I was, you know, thinner and younger, somebody say, man, I used to play basketball all the time. And so, you know, back then, wasn't afraid to take my shirt off. And, you know, you go, shirts and skins. So, you know, and, and so, you know, I, we were shirts one day, and I had a scar, and another brother had a scar, and, 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 and he, he said, man, you got stabbed too? I was like, no, no, I didn't get stabbed. This, this, this is a scar from my penis. I was like, oh, man, it looked just like my scar. And it, it dawned upon me that all of us have scars. But we can assume, folks, scars and wounds are a result of the same trauma that we had to endure. 
Now, there are some scars that are actually a demonstration of a cut to heal you, not to kill you. Yeah, you go in, and, 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 and you, you, they cut your, your chest from, from, from here to there. It's not to kill you. It's to help fix some things. Conversely, you can have a cut from here to there. Somebody was trying to do a number on you. But when it heals, it all looks the same. Jesus comes into this fear-driven room and says, look at my scars. These scars are evidence of my resurrection. Not as we got stories and we got scars and we trying to hide. And we'll dress it all up. We won't talk about it. We, we, we act like we ain't, we, we ain't got no, no wounds, no scars. Because we've been taught that our wounds and our scars should be things we're ashamed of. Folk who've been in jail and in prison. Folk who've done things that even they themselves have suppressed because it's been so terrible. Things you've endured, challenges you've had to overcome, and you bear it in your body, the wounds and the scars. I wanted to tell you today that those wounds and scars are not things for your shaming. They're things to remind you that God gave you a chance to begin again. You can't show me your wounds and scars if you did. So the fact you walking around here with the wounds and the scars of life? How I many know God knows how to take those wounds and scars and make them a testimony? Make them a source of healing for somebody else. We begin again by becoming proximal, close to the wounds and the scars first of Jesus then ourselves, which then will allow us to be comfortable with the wounds and the scars of others. So I just, you know, want, want, want you to think on these things. I, I didn't get a chance to breathe in, breathe in, you know, getting the Holy Ghost breathed on you, amen, but just blow like this. <laughs> I mean, that's what Jesus wants to do, just blow his spirit into your life in a way that brings activity and healing. And if I had a little more time, I, I, I make connection between Genesis chapter 2 when the scripture says that when God formed humans from the dust of the ground, he breathed into them the ruach, the breath of life, and they became a living soul. I think Jesus breathing into these scaredy cat disciples was giving them a new confidence, a new courage to keep on pressing on. The world would love to make you hide in a room, live your life in an open air prison as if resurrection is not real. But I hear Jesus saying, let me breathe. The ruach in you. So you can become a living, breathing testimony. That resurrection is real. And it's at work in your life today. Come on, stand with us, everyone.